Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today our guest is nobody. Rich and I are going to be talking about how we got started gambling, starting actually playing games before we were gambling, and eventually into being successful gamblers. And later on, we'll talk a little bit how Richard is teaching his own son, who's in his early 20s, uh, a bit about gambling. Yeah, I, I often get asked, you know, how did you start and... and uh, which I'm sure you do too, uh-huh. and, and then I also often get asked, like, what what can I do? Uh, you know, what should I do if I want to get involved and all that? So, so yeah, I think uh, we'll answer some of those questions and go from there. And everybody's path is different, so you can't walk the same path that somebody else did 30 years ago because the world is a whole lot different. And you're either smarter than I am or dumber than I am, better at talking to people or worse than talking to people, better at math or worse at math, or blah, blah, blah. But but not better looking. Oh, it couldn't be that. uh, I was talking about myself, actually. ah. (laughs) So um, so so this will give you an idea how we got started. Um, I'm real close to 70 years old now. Uh, when I was a boy, I was pretty sickly, had pneumonia a number of times, had asthma, stayed home from school a lot, read a lot, jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles. Uh, I read books on how to play chess, uh, all kinds of things to keep my mind active. I pl- played with my younger brothers and sisters. I would kick their ass, although I was two and a half years older, and of course if I was ten and he was seven, that was kind of an inherent advantage. My father was never a great chess player or a poker player, but he had played in the Army, which was, I was born in 47 and he got out of the Army in 45, so when I was ten, it had been 12 years earlier that he had played, and he was decent, he's smart, and so just playing with this smart adult gave me insights that I wouldn't get playing with my peers. You know, I, I grew up in Chicago, and um, the, we- the winter is insane, and when it's below zero, people back there play games. They play cards. They play board games. They just, because they don't want to go out in the ridiculous cold and the snow, it, it was just a lot more popular. So I think if you're exposed to a lot of games young uh and and enjoy them you know it's a kind of a natural progression yeah that's an advantage i didn't have i i lived in los angeles and and in january it was you know cold which is 55 (laughs) degrees but you could still go outside and play and throw football around stuff like that. you were sick instead of cold so i didn't have the advantage of of living in miserable weather um i all the competition i could find I would take up whether it was playing chess with other people, being on a chess team or a debate team or a checker club at one school, uh, always trying to compete against others, generally better than my peers, although it wasn't a it wasn't a high level of peers. We I went to public schools. We lived in a part of the Los Angeles City School System which was on the border between well at the time was called Watts which is an area of where there were riots in 64 and it was uh, basically the worst part of town Gardena which was uh, becoming more Japanese and they highly valued education and so it was like our schools were like a third white, a third Asian and a third black and the in the classes do you remember when you first made a bet i mean you were competing at these games but do you remember when you actually bet something i don't remember the specific incident but 
I would have been 10 or 12, somewhere in that range. There, uh, My next door neighbor was Denny Shoemaker, and he was a sucker for all my bets. He could throw a baseball further than I could, and his dad would take us to baseball games, and they put up with me. But when it came to cards or checkers or chess or something, he was a sucker. So you just one day decided to, to say, let's play for money? And he, and he was amenable. Sort of. I don't, I don't know who talked me into it, but I had, uh, you know, when I would go to the library to check out books on how to play games, there were poker books in there, in that section. And so I was reading how to play poker books when I was eight or nine or ten. And so I knew about gambling of sorts, but um, so it was not a real stretch. I mean, I I was always really, you know, competitive, too, playing games and learned, you know, games very young. My grandmother taught me how to play gin rummy when I was three. Um, but I remember uh, I have an older brother, two years older, and when he was in high school, I don't think I was in high school yet, but he w- invited a bunch of friends over to play poker. And I had always watched my dad and my grandfather play poker, um, but... So this was the first time they, you know, included me. I could play, and we were literally playing for nickels and dimes. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And but that was the first time that I played poker for money, and I ended up winning, you know, five dollars and twenty cents or something like that. And to me, it was like the heavens opened. I mean, I was like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing in the world. You can actually make money playing cards. What could be better than that? <laughs> yeah, one time off the air, you told me that you made money because your grandfather made money playing cards. What was that all about? Well, yeah, my grandfather, uh, you know, he played poker and gin rummy and pinochle, and uh, he was always a winning player. He would keep track of his wins and losses, and at the, he would always, at the end of his games, he would throw the change into this cigar box. Well, all the money would go in the cigar box or come out if he lost, and and then at the after New Year's, he would take all of the coins and put them in pickle jars and divide them among all the grandkids. But I used to love watching him play poker. And uh, my dad was, would play with him. And my dad was a terrible poker player, but my grandfather was a, was a good one. And um, so, you know, I remember being six years old, sitting behind them, watching them play. And the highlight of the night for me was when one of them had to go to the bathroom and I would get to play their hand. Um, and, and you know, mostly I was the waitress. Uh, all of the guys drank scotch, so I would go to the, you know, bar to get them their scotches. And, of course, I'd fill them too full and have to sip it down. And that's where I learned to play poker and drink scotch. So, <laughs> But, yeah, so my father, my grandfather definitely was a, a big influence in the uh in gambling because I saw that it was possible to actually win consistently. So your granddad was good and your dad was bad. So would you sit behind your grandfather to learn or sit behind your father to learn what not to do or No, I sat behind my grandfather. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to watch him cuz I knew he was good, <laughs> you know. Could you pick up much from watching what he did? Um you know, I was six or seven. Um, I don't. I guess I must have picked up something. I mean, he basically played really tight. Uh, so I did notice that he was folding a lot, and my dad was playing a lot. Um, was this draw poker? Yeah, yeah. They played. They played uh, five card draw. Yep. So if he, you got a sense as to how often he kept kickers. Yeah, and always once a night he would. Uh, usually it would involve he would have a pair of deuces and he would raise and stand pat and bet and raise and play the hand as if he had you know a full, full house. house or something uh-huh. and um, and he would always show it I mean he would almost never get called because everybody knew he was a tight player and he would always show the hand and I got it I, I, I got even at that young age that he was advertising that he wanted them to know that sometimes he was going to bluff. And um, so, yeah, I, I learned some lessons from him. But it wasn't, I didn't, read any, I didn't read any books on poker until after that night where I played myself and won money, and then I did the same thing as you. I went to the library and, 
got whatever books they had on poker, which there were not mon- many at that time. Maverick, <laughs> Maverick's Book of Poker was one of them. Um, Education of a Poker Player by Yardley was a, one I really enjoyed. I did too, but that one talks about his experiences in the Second World War or something, and hard to relate to when he was playing... Uh, well, but, you know, I like the, the blackjack books that were uh, along that line, too. That was one of the reasons I liked uh, Ken Houston's blackjack books was because he had stories about playing, and Yardley had stories about playing poker in China during World War II where he was a uh-huh. spy. I mean, you know, he had a pretty cool uh, life. And he lived to tell about it, which one of the reasons it made it cool. Um, in that time period I, I also started to read about blackjack and revere's book do you remember the name of it i don't playing blackjack is a business playing blackjack is a business my first blackjack book yeah. had all these charts in it so I, I went through that and i learned it pretty well the part in there that was the most influential to me was he was talking about all these good games in vegas that there was a single deck blackjack game at Caesar's Palace and you could uh, it was strip rules which at the time was a even money game and they would give you they would comp you in suites and fly you there and pick up your room charges and all these things were promised and it would really be impressive to the ladies you could bring there now I was this high school kid at the time um, hadn't kissed my first girl yet uh, this sounded wonderful. I was willing to play an even game if I could get laid. This was this was pretty good. So <laughs> that sounds like a good trade-off. But how did you find the book? I mean, did somebody tell you about it, or you just happened to cross it? I would just always check the the gaming section in the library, and so this was a. Uh, Los Angeles Public Library System, and we had a uh, two or three branches close to us, and there was a city system and the county system, and they were different, but they also they they had selections, and so I would always check out, and one day that book appeared and checked it out. See, in my case, I um, I had taken a backgammon, and uh, I, I did the same thing. I went to the library, got all the backgammon books I could. and um, At that time, backgammon really was popular, and a lot of local bars would hold weekly tournaments. And I would go to a lot of those weekly tournaments. This would have been early 70s, maybe? Yeah, early, very early 70s. And um, so I, I was at these backgammon tournaments all the time, and I met a dentist who was a regular player, and he told me he had just come back from Las Vegas and, um, you know, he had a system for winning at blackjack. I was like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, how many of those stories? And you have one at roulette, too, right? Um, but he said, no, no. He said, this is real. Um, you know, you can beat the game of blackjack by keeping track of the cards. And he started to describe the mathematics of it. And I started to think, oh, this sounds plausible, right? Maybe this guy isn't an idiot. Um, And I asked him, you know, if there was a book, and he said, Revere's book, Playing Blackjack is a Business. And uh, I had to special order it. Uh, I went to the bookstore and had to special order it, and and, uh, eventually it came. And, yeah, that that was how I learned about Blackjack and really sort of changed the trajectory of my life (laughs) because once I read that book um, you know by this time I was in college and I was making my way through college playing backgammon and poker and once I read that book I thought well once I turn 21 I'll just uh, my degree was in theater and my plan was to go to LA and become a famous movie star (laughs) of course how how did that work out (laughs) Great. (laughs) Um, But I was unwilling to go there and be a dishwasher at night to be a a starving actor. So my plan was, well, I'll just go to Las Vegas and, you know, make 
a fortune with this card counting uh, and play backgammon at the same time and poker and, you know, just be a professional gambler until I have enough money to go to L.A. and be an actor and not have to wash dishes at night. Um, so that pretty much, you know, that that end is what ended up happening. I ended up, uh, I mean, I read, I read playing blackjack as a business. I would practice in my basement. I learned basic strategy, you know, down cold. And, um, for my 21st birthday, my gift to myself was one of those, you know, four days and three nights in fabulous Las Vegas that includes the airfare and the whole bit. And, uh, this is Vegas world. Uh, no, no, Vegas world didn't exist yet. Um, this there there was a little dump on the strip next to the flamingo it wasn't the flamingo it was called the flamingo capri and don't remember that yeah well i i didn't know any better so i booked this thing and when we got here it turned out that they had overbooked this this casino had one table um uh-huh. and some slots and uh, they had overbooked, and they ended up putting me out at the showboat, which was on Boulder Highway. That's a long way away. That is a long way away. And I uh, complained, and I rented a car, and they picked up the rental car for me. So it turned out to be a better deal. It was a nicer hotel, and I got a rental car so I could go all over and explore everywhere. And uh, uh, I was only playing basic strategy, but I won about $200 on that trip. And I thought, oh. You know, if I can win like this, just knowing basic strategy, just think how much money I can win if I know how to count. That's right. Easy to extrapolate. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, then as soon as I graduated uh, college, I basically packed up the car and moved out here. All right. So now Richard mentioned he went to L.A., which was eventually when I met him in the late 70s. I want to, before we get to that and us meeting each other, I want to go back a little bit to when I started backgammon. I first learned about backgammon in the early 70s. I think it was a um, in a Playboy magazine, which I only read for the articles. That's why I had the Playboy magazine. Well, Playboy was a big promoter of backgammon. Yes, and they I were. actually went and played a tournament uh, that was sponsored by Playboy. They had a big party at the Playboy Mansion in Chicago. And... Um, yeah. yeah, I played against Christy Hefner at the in the tournament. Yes, N- not a bad way to play a tournament. <laughs> uh, I got to play against Lucille Ball in just before she died, so that was not quite the same experience at all. But uh, what, but actually, that was pretty cool. The um, so I started picking up. I went and bought all the backgammon books I could find. There weren't many of them and the ones that were there weren't very good there was a Oswald Jacoby and somebody John Crawford had a yeah. book uh, Obolinsky Prince Obolinsky saw that book. one I was at the Alpha System uh, no I don't think that was, that wasn't the name of it but. so Tim Holland had a book and so these but I mastered what they had in it and so I had been working in a uh, think tank in Santa Monica, which is near the beach, and didn't do well there because they didn't really check your hours, and you can spend as much time at the beach as you wanted to, and I spent too much time at the beach and not enough time in the office, and so I underperformed, and so after a couple years, they let me go. Uh... But then by that time, I thought I was pretty good at backgammon. So I heard about this club in West Hollywood. It was called the Cavendish West. The Cavendish was a club in Manhattan in New York. And I also, there was a Cavendish in Chicago, and I spent all of my days at the Cavendish in Chicago. So I started going there, and I uh, had some money saved up, was collecting unemployment and winning at the Cavendish because early on I was a better player than most of the others there because they had not read as much as I had and uh, later there was a book by Paul McGreal called Backgammon 
which was a huge eye opener at the Cavendish. The we were not playing anything like what he suggested. And then when the book came out, I got a copy right away. I just started creaming the other players because I was slotting checkers, which means basically taking chances other people wouldn't take and started to do well. Eventually, how the better players played was picked up by all the others, and so I no longer had an edge. But uh, my skill at backgammon came from reading. It came from playing what we call propositions, where you set up a position, and there's an infinite number of positions, and you say, well, I think red... The red checkers have the advantage over the white checkers. And somebody will say, no, I think you're wrong. And so let's play. And so we agree to play for 20 games or 50 games or however much they were. Some propositions take only a few rolls to figure out. Some can take a long time. And so I would try to remember these positions. And so I learned, but I was not one of the best players. After a while, I could only beat the second tier players could not beat the top tier players and there were there's a lot of top tier players who hung out at the Cavendish and so um, eventually as it turned out I got went broke and had to go out and get a job which was awful ever oh god that was terrible god forbid ah the uh, which was actually a great lesson Uh, I only went broke once and I never want to, never want to go out and have to get a job again. The, um, but when Richard came along, probably '78, I first met him. Do you remember when you first went to Cavendish? It would have been, yeah, something like that, late '70s. I, I wasn't, I hadn't moved to LA. I just uh, was, I was living here in Las Vegas, still playing a lot of backgammon here. And some of us knew there was going to be a tournament in LA, so we drove in and, and went to the Cavendish for the tournament. So I was under the impression that I had been to a few tournaments and I thought I was pretty good. So anybody I didn't recognize, uh, ipso facto, I had to be a better player than them. So Richard came along. Would you like to play? Sure. Come on, sit down. Now, I never figured out that he was a better player than me. I probably played, I don't know, 90% as good as him, 95%. I don't know. But uh, he was better. And But in backgammon, every particular game, there's luck involved. You know, if you had only rolled this instead of that, the whole thing would have been different. And so any session where he beat me, it was clearly because he got lucky. Well, that's it, what makes it such a great gambling game. So any sessions I beat him, well, that's justice. I mean, of course I'm going to beat him. I'm a better player. And the fact that he beat me more than I beat him over time was just, he's a lucky son of a bitch. I don't know. So I never figured out he was better than me. Some of the other players, I played long enough that I got to, all right, there's no real doubt here. (laughs) But with Richard, I didn't really, he wasn't there enough for me to really come to that conclusion. And um, looking. That was, that for me was actually my strength in the game is I was always underestimated. People just never, there was something about me, I just look harmless or stupid or something, and people just never gave me credit for being able to play. And there was a guy in Chicago who, um, (laughs) he gave me what, what we called the slow boat proposition. He kept telling me that he wanted to get me on a slow boat to China, you know. And this was a player that I was clearly better than. And, um... So he came up with the following proposition that uh, he would, we would go to Las Vegas. People were talking about making a trip to Las Vegas at that time. And he said, I will pay for your airfare um, if the entire time we're on the plane, you have to play backgammon with me for $50 a point. And I was, please don't throw me in that briar patch, <laughs> right? Now, and Did you have the bankroll for this, or it would be easy to get backers? Yeah, well, yeah. 
yeah, I had the bankroll for it, and and but one of the players who was one of the only players in Chicago better than I am or was told him, "You're out of your mind. Like you're not a better player than Munchkin is. You know, you're you're crazy to offer him this proposition." So it never happened. But but as I was saying, that that was my strength. There were guys who would play backgammon with me that would not play against other players. And I remember a friend of mine got so steamed one time because um, I had come to the club and I sat down and I was playing with this old bookmaker who was this really nice guy, couldn't play at all. I mean, he was at best a, a low intermediate player and he would never play with any of the good players. And I sat down and we started playing and um my friend came in and he he sees me playing this guy and he goes can we make this a chouette and the guy says no 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 no. we're just playing heads up and they had a rule that any chouette was open if somebody if you had a chouette chouette is back aiming for more than two people um and if you had a chouette going anybody who wanted to join could but if you're playing heads up you don't have to make it a chouette so Freddie says, no, 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 we're just going to play heads up. And he leans across the table to me and he goes, we don't want those hustlers in our game. <laughs> you agreed, of course. Of course I agreed, yeah, yeah. So, and I, I have to tell you another story about my persona or the way people perceive me. So when I came to Las Vegas, I got a job as a dealer because I didn't have the bankroll to play blackjack right away for big stakes. And I thought that'd be the perfect place to practice counting cards by dealing it eight hours a day anyway I was dealing and this guy was a really sort of happy boisterous guy you know uh, kind of life of the party type and he's on my table and we're talking and we're having a good time and basically it turns out this guy is a golf hustler and he uh, only had one leg. And I guess that was part of his shtick, right? Like, he apparently was a really good golfer, but he had a prosthetic leg. And he says to me, uh, you know, let's go out and play. I'll give you a stroke a hole. And I said, you don't know me from Adam. A stroke a hole is an enormous spot. How can you, how can you offer me that? And he said, I can just look at you and tell that you can't play. And, and then he said, in fact, I'll take off my leg and use that as the club. <laughs> Which I don't think he was serious about that, but who knows? Maybe he had played that kind of proposition. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was the sort of the, what I projected to people was that I must not be able to play at whatever the game was. That's, I did not project that. Perhaps it was my vocabulary. Perhaps I was wearing glasses and looked like a smart kid, which was really to my detriment. Uh, so people generally overestimated me. It's actually, they still do. They think Bob Dancer never makes a mistake at video poker, which is a level I could never live up to. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So before we move on from our backgammon days... There was another character at the Cavendish who hung out there. His name was Gabby Horowitz. Gabby Horowitz was a... I think he was Israeli. He was a... like a street urchin kind of a cheat. He had very fast hands. He could distract you and make checkers disappear. And... his... uh... And he was, he was a competent player, not great, but his sleight of hand tricks could uh, even up the match. He was good at PR, too. I mean, he ended up, he had a column in, in a syndicated backgammon column in newspapers across the country. Yes, although he had a, uh, a co-writer, Dr. Bruce Roman, who um, cleaned up Gabby's English a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but so I actually... Uh, took classes from Gabby, which was uh, interesting. Uh, 
So later on, we would play uh, backgammon if uh, if Gabby rolled like a six and a four, which um, all the math majors out there knows that adds up with ten. And uh, I had a loose checker eleven spaces away. He would just take his checker and put it on mine and put mine on the bar, meaning he hit me. Ten Snap up his dice. You know, and I'd just look at him and I'd say, nice play. <laughs> and he'd put it back. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> because a lot of people, he would just snap up his dice and you would go, you had a 6-4. And he'd say, no, I didn't. I had a 6-5. It was 11. <laughs> you know, and now you can sit there and argue about it for however you want to argue. But Well, when I would play him in tournaments, I would insist on there being a spotter, insist on there being a witness. Yeah. Uh, another one who really influenced my backgammon career, was not much of a player, but he's a a theoretician. His name was Danny Kleinman, and he wrote thousands of pages on how he thought the right way to play backgammon was. Now, later on, it appears as though some of his theories were not the same as the ones coming out of New York, where um, in New York you had... Uh, a lot of really smart players talking to each other and working things out together. And in Los Angeles, Danny was pretty much on his own. And so some of his uh, theories were discredited, perhaps, later on. But he was a big influence in my life. You know, uh, that that brings up a really um, important point. Uh, Both of us, when we wanted to learn how to do something went to the library and read everything we could find on the subject but the other thing that's really important is to get around players that are better than you that already know how to do what it is you're trying to learn and and learn from them and I think that the players in New York had a big advantage because there were so many good players there and they were all kind of sharing information and learning from each other and advancing the game. And it, it's easier to learn if you have access to, you know, to, to good, good players. Some of those players are still out there gambling in various ways. There was Paul McGreal. There was Jason Lester. There was Mike Sankowitz. Billy there. Horan, yeah. And Dennis Waterman spent some time there. Uh, so we didn't have that in in Los Angeles. Another part was... Most of my skill came from reading, not from figuring it out myself. The better players, many of them, would write computer programs on and say, and let the computer figure out which was better than another. Now in bear-offs, which is the an ending part of backgammon, that's that can be an exact science if you have a computer program. And, and yeah, this and computers were not accessible back then. People didn't have their own home computers. So even though I had been a COBOL computer programmer uh, previously, uh, I didn't know how to program uh, the PCs that were there, the Commodores or whatever else they were. And so I couldn't figure it out by myself. The better players had better tools and or perhaps were smarter. The pl- well, and they, they were more obsessive, I think, because they would uh, roll positions out hundreds of times by hand just to, you know, get a better understanding of positions. So you can imagine, uh, you know, if you were a Hold'em player before computers and you would have to just you know, deal hands by hand uh, over and over again to look at, to try to determine things. It was, yeah, it was a different era. And I'm I'm not sure whether Hold'em is easier or harder than Backgammon. They're different. I mean, Backgammon is a complete information game, but there's a whole lot of different positions. Yeah. Hold'em is an incomplete information game, but there's not that many different combinations. So I don't know which is harder. The um, Another problem I had is Los Angeles has a lot of distractions. For me, one of the distractions was nude beaches. 
I was um, I was born in forty seven, so like seventy three when I started, I would have been twenty six. And Venice Beach in the Los Angeles area was nude for about a year and a half before they got it closed down, and then they moved up to Topanga for a summer, and then they moved up to Zuma for a while. And I enjoyed this. The um, At that time of my life, although I really wanted to become a better backgammon player, the real object of my life was to get laid. And any women who came to nude beaches were not particularly shy. <laughs> and so, uh, and there was uh, adult beverages there. There was uh, adult tobacco, shall we say, there. Uh, and so sometimes I would uh, enjoy the day rather than use it studying, yep. which was uh, not a good use of my time. Well, not a good long-term use of my time. It sure was a fun use of my time. You know, I, I want to bring up, a, a, you mentioned Tim Holland earlier. Mm-hmm. And I, I learned an important lesson back then that being the best player didn't mean you were going to make the most money. So Tim Holland was a guy who made probably more money playing backgammon than all of... He was a horrible player. But he made more money than anybody else because he was in the right social scene. He could play against very wealthy people and he had the bankroll to do that. And it made me realize that there's this whole other level that you can try to aspire to. Um, another guy who came, who became kind of a master of that is Mike Swobotny. Yes. Who uh, he could just get games with people that that other people that other people would never be able to play against. And and it it came up in blackjack even if you look at the case of Don Johnson, right? He is not the greatest blackjack player in the world, but if you have a big enough bankroll, you can kind of jump to a whole new level that that the the young smart guys just can't don't have a chance to to do, you know, without a whole different way of thinking about the game. You know what I'm saying? Well, I do, and when Don was on our show, he indicated that maybe there was somebody with a baseball hat standing nearby who would give him signals. Well, yeah, but but if you're you know if you're that level of player, you can you can hire or, or you know what I mean. So yeah, Tim Holland, I'm sure could go get lessons from the best players if he wanted, but but the point was he could still get the games that the rest of us couldn't get. Yeah, so like uh, Sobotny is in your book, is in uh, the Gambling Wizards. And Sobotny would play with these great people. He was better than them, but when they would beat him, he would be really pleasant, congratulate them, and be happy for them, and he'd be invited back. Uh, right, and he wasn't a nit, you know. I mean... He would pay for dinner. He would, you know, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't trying to squeeze every, every dollar out of the situation. And he would, he would take the wrong side of a proposition, just knowing that he had the worst of it, just to sort of show the people that he had some gamble, um, you know. And other players, if, um, if they lost to an inferior player, they would the backgammon equivalent of Phil Hillmuth. Yeah, yeah. That's really the reason I gave up the game. There were just too many assholes. Just, and and a lot of the worst assholes were the guys. If you really wanted to make money, those were the guys you had to play against. And it just became really sort of distasteful to me. Well, yeah, that was one of the reasons I gave up. Another reason was the Cavendish had trouble staying afloat. It changed owners a number of times and eventually just stopped. And, and eventually the game fell out of favor too. It did. There were not there was not new blood coming in. So the only players you could play against were the pros trying to hustle you or trying to beat you. And even even if Richard and I were equal players, 
when we go to the Cavendish, they would charge, you know, $10 to play four hours or however much they charge would be dependent on what stakes we were playing. So even if we were equal, the house would eat us up. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, they weren't equal. But near the end, so it was in the um, early 80s, for three or four years in a row, there became million-dollar backgammon tournaments in Las Vegas. And this was, this was a pretty attractive. So uh, I think it was a $500 or $1,000 entry fee. And uh, the winner got a million dollars guaranteed. Although, if you if you knew the guy making the guarantee, he was not that great. So a lot of us decided, well, we're going to go to Vegas. And so that's when I started. Well, if I'm going to be in Vegas, I might as well beat him at blackjack too. So I was practicing all that at the time. And so uh, f- f- my first trip to Vegas was maybe 80, 81, something like that and staying at the the dunes which is now where Bellagio is and uh did okay a couple times uh beat the head of the uh the the owner of the Cavendish uh in the tournament and so he kicked me out of the Cavendish cuz he cuz I beat him here that was an interesting no um I'm, might as well, I've, I've, I've hinted at it. Might as well tell the story. The owner at the time was an excellent gambler named Hugh Sconyers. Uh Richard knows him. The he was probably the best player in Los Angeles at the time too. He was good. He was somebody like who graduated MIT from like for like three weeks of study or something. I mean, he's just incredibly bright guy. And so we were playing in the tournament. And my dice were luckier than his dice uh, on the partic- in the sessions we had gone so far. So um, he called for a dice change. Now, a way dice change works in backgammon is if a player thinks the other guy's dice are luckier, he can demand once per game that they put all four dice into one of the cups, shake it, and then... They each take, take turns picking one. They each take turns picking one. And the guy who didn't who asked for the dice change asked for the dice change picks second and then he's ended up with the fourth one. So he calls for dice change, so I poured my two dice out on the table, he picked it up, put it in his cup and shook it and we picked. And then on the very next hand, I said, I want a dice change. And he goes, you can't have a dice change. I just had a dice change. I go, I think it's hokey, but if you can have a dice change, I can too. So he got upset by that because I somehow had unchanged his dice. And it was just a bad reaction to uh, to him losing to an obviously inferior player. So he kicked me out of the Cavendish. Wow, that's really surprising to me that... that- that that alone would be enough to have him not want you in the club. I mean, well, it's uh, but in a couple of days, I went in and apologized, said sorry, and everything was fine, and uh, so I was in full standing again. But oh, okay. uh, so it wasn't a permanent ban, but it was um, there was uh, so in in a backgammon tournament skill. The winners have an edge, or good players have an edge, but there's still a considerable amount of luck. And uh, a competent player can beat an excellent player uh, in a uh, 21-point match or something like that. When I first came here to Las Vegas, you know, in addition to reading the books on backgammon and poker and all that, I just read whatever kind of gambling books I could find. Scarney's Complete Guide to Gambling and just anything I could find I would read and uh, one of my favorite books was a book called Fast Company by John Bradshaw Um, it it was actually kind of a inspiration for my book Gambling Wizards it it was profiles rather than interviews it was profiles with six 
professional gamblers. Uh, Minnesota Fats, Puggy Pearson, Amarillo Slim, Bobby Riggs, um, maybe Doyle Brunson. I don't know. I, I don't remember exactly who everybody was. But Bobby Riggs, a tennis player. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he was quite a hustler. He, he, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, so I, I had read these books. Well, when I first came here to Las Vegas, the first night I heard there was a backgammon club and it was at some discotheque and... Um, so I go and I come into the club and here is the guy who runs the club was a guy named Mike Maxiculi and he is playing backgammon with Puggy Pearson. Now, you know, I mean, to me, I'm 22 years old and Puggy Pearson is like this guy I've been reading about who's just, you know, it'd be like, uh, you know, seeing Kobe Bryant sitting there or something. And, uh, but you wouldn't expect Kobe Bryant necessarily to be a good gambler. You would expect Puggy Pearson to be good well, at backgammon. Yes, no, I mean, you know, for my son is into basketball. For him, it would be Kobe Bryant. I was into gambling. For me, it would have been Puggy or Doyle or Amarillo Slim or somebody like that, you know. And um, they're playing. And I go over and I stand there and I'm just kind of watching them play. And uh, my, Max looks up at me and he goes uh uh do you play and i said yeah and he said i think they had just finished their game he says uh do you want to play some and i said sure although i was really nervous um and he said uh you know what do you want to play for and i didn't know what to say you know so i think i said five dollars a point and you know he was probably playing puggy for 50 or 100 or something and he kind of cocks his head and he looks at me and he goes you're not a hustler are you (laughs) and uh, you know i i'm sure i turned red you know because in my mind i was thinking oh my god these guys are just raw meat you know and uh i was very young and naive but uh yeah, Ma- that was funny. Max himself had a few moves. Well, that came later. Yeah, later Max became a cheat. And, um, you know, there was an era there in the early to mid-'80s where a lot of cheating started happening um, in backgammon. And, yeah, Max was certainly among them. Um, he cheated me out of $14,000 one night before I realized what, you know, what was going on. Um but that all came later. All right. So let's leave the backgammon world for a while. Let's move to blackjack. So for me, my blackjack trip started in early 80s. And would read everything I could and memorize the charts and then go and play. The first one I wanted to learn before I went to Vegas was Revere's Advance Point Count. This is a three-level system. It's kind of difficult. I didn't have it completely mastered. I had no idea that even a simple one-level system done well is a whole lot better than a three-level system done 95% well and so but that's what I started with and um, big mistake didn't have any mentors had I run into Richard at that time I mean I knew him but I didn't consider him a mentor Uh, you know and he would and he would have said you know learn high low or learn high up one or whatever he would have recommended well, you know, when I got here, um, I started with the high-low, but quickly added the high-op two to to play single decks. So at that time, there were still plenty of single decks around Las Vegas. So I would play the high-op two with a side count of aces for single deck, but I would play high-low if I was playing shoe games. And when I started... Remember, I was dealing, and I didn't have a big bankroll, and I would go out after, you know, after work and play for nickels and, and uh, 
and I would practice while I was dealing. Um, but you're talking about having mentors. I, I don't know if mentor was the right word, but I've often said if I had to play blackjack alone, I wouldn't play. And 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 the having teammates is what happened. That's really what uh, was the difference for me. And um, I think I've told this story on the air before, but I'll I'll tell it again. I was dealing and Vegas was a very small town and all of the card counters really knew each other because there was nowhere else to play there was no Atlantic City you could play in Reno or you could play in Vegas and and Tahoe and that was about it I mean so everybody knew one another and a guy actually let me digress for a second People always say to me, oh, my God, it must have been blackjack heaven. It was so great back then. It was all the single deck that was even off the top and, you know, four deck shoes with 26 cards cut. And that was all well and good, but it's, to me, it's so much better today because there are so many more places to play. I mean, if you got barred around Las Vegas, unless you were ready to, you know, go to Europe or Asia... You didn't have much place. You didn't have many options. So, um, so to me, that was not blackjack paradise back then. I mean, the shuffles were really great. But, um, but anyway, so uh, I was dealing one night, and a guy came into the club. Actually, he's still around. A guy named Will Hale. A lot of the old timers know Will. But anyway, uh, he came in and he said. There's a guy in town from Australia, and he wants to play backgammon for a lot of money. So I said, set it up, <laughs> right? Whatever he wants to play for. And um, at that time, I thought I played backgammon really well. And I thought there were maybe a dozen guys in the world that were better than me, and none of them were from Australia. So... I was happy to set up whatever with a, with this Australian guy. So uh, Will got back to me and he said, you know, the guy's staying at the Desert Inn on a comp and, you know, we're all going to be there on Friday and, and, you know, come on over. And I said, can I bring some friends, you know, who are also players? He said, yeah, maybe we'll have a big chouette. So um, on Friday, I had two friends who were back in my players from Chicago that basically – came out here when I moved here to visit and never left. <laughs> and um, so I took them with me to the Desert Inn. And I get there, and the guy there is a guy named David Lang, who's now dead, unfortunately. But um, da- the first thing David says when he opens the door is, I've done some calling around, and I've heard that I'm really outclassed. So I don't want to play for a lot of money. And I said, you know, that's all right. We can play for small stakes. We'll just, and he's like, we can order up lots of room service and we'll just, you know, play small stakes. And there were a couple of other guys in the room, a couple of other blackjack players. And uh, one of those other blackjack players was another Australian guy named Alan Woods, who is one of the guys in my book. So we spent a week ordering up room service and, and having this I think it was a $3 chouette or something, so very small stakes. But we were having a great time. <laughs> and um, at the end of a week, Alan Woods says to me, how come you guys, meaning me and my two friends, aren't playing blackjack for more money? I said, well, we don't have a bankroll. You know, we, we don't have a lot of money, so we're just out betting nickels. He goes, well, how about if I put up $20,000 and you guys play for me and you double it and we'll split it 60-40? 60 to him, of course. And uh, I said, you've known me, you've known us a week, and you're going to give us $20,000 to go gamble with and report back to you how we do? And he reached into his coat, and he pulled out $20,000, and he slid it across the table to me. And that was really how I started playing blackjack for bigger stakes. I mean, and if it hadn't been for that, uh, who knows which... Well, where my life would have led. I mean, that was really a defining moment in the future of my life. So I owe Alan Woods a lot. <laughs> He's dead too, unfortunately. I'm getting nervous being a friend of Richard. They all seem yeah. to die. <laughs> Let's have a few words from our sponsors. 
The South Point has more than 10,000 games returning more than 99%. This is more games than anybody else has like that. The October promotion has casino-wide progressives. The big one starts at $10,000, must be hit by $25,000. Uh, in addition to the player hitting it, any player with their card in, when it hits, receives $25 in free play. There is a minor progressive between $1,000 and $2,500. It's expected to hit about three times per day. The progressives combined are expected to give out $600,000 in October. Halloween will have two times points for video poker, quite a few more times points for reels. At videopoker.com, they have four or five new games at the Global Gaming Expo, which is the trade show in town that ended just before this uh, show is going to go on the air. We'll be talking about these shows in a few weeks on this program. Uh, they had more new games in, in video poker than all of the other companies put together. Their game of the week is split poker. This is a six coin per line game. Excuse me, 10 coin per line game. Periodically on the deal or on the draw, you get a split card. Split card is randomly any of the 52 cards let's say six of clubs for an example, and randomly, one third of the time each, that six of clubs will split into a five of clubs, six of clubs, a six of clubs, seven of clubs, or a six of clubs, six of clubs. So uh, you get high payouts for a six card royal flush, which is ace through nine of the same suit and five of a kind. All right, let's go back to talking about Alan Woods some more. Anyway, I was saying that I had I owed Alan Woods a big debt uh, of gratitude. Um, but the other thing that happened to me was when I was playing for Alan, my two friends and I started playing on that team for Alan. And I lost and lost and lost and lost. And basically, at the end of 160 hours of play, I was stuck big. Oh, now I, I should also say that at that time, our approach to the game was most of the bosses in Las Vegas thought that shoe games were not beatable. So they were watching the single deck games very closely, and a lot of places had started dealing double decks as well. So we just didn't play those at all. We only played the shoe games. And there were many uh, shoe games that were four decks cut one, sometimes four decks cut half of a deck, uh, six decks cut one, uh, or sometimes less. So we only played shoe games, and we on that bankroll, we were spreading from a nickel to two hands of 200. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So you could spread massively. The penetration was great, and I just could not win. And uh, three or four different times... I had people go out with me and sit at the table with me and watch me play because I was convinced I must be doing something wrong. And every time they said, no, you did everything right, you're just unlucky. Um, so uh, that went on for, I don't know, two months or something. Um, and then Alan had to go back to Australia. And at that time, he said, we need to shut down the bankroll, even though it was stuck. Um, and he offered um, to my friend to play with his, the team that he was leaving. And uh, I basically said, screw this, you know, uh, this doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, I thought it worked, but I didn't know what the problem was. And, and I just was tired of getting my brains beat in every time I went, even though it wasn't my money. And I said, I'm going back to, you know, I was still dealing. So I was also kind of burned out because I was trying to, I was dealing 40 hours a week and trying to go out and play. Um, so I went back to dealing. And, you know, the second sort of major thing happened was my friend who joined 
Allen's old team, they started winning money like crazy. And uh, after a couple of months, he came to me and he said, you got to give this another chance, you know, because we're just winning like crazy. I mean, they broke a bankroll in like 10 days. They would play and they would double their bankrolls, you know. And the bankrolls were starting out small, you know, ten or $20,000 bankrolls or whatever. But um, so he said, you got to give this another chance. And, and thankfully, I listened to him and I said, OK. And I went out and started playing again and, and then started winning. So I owe, I owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude as well. So. Is this somebody I know probably? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I do. <laughs> he became a video poker player when they first introduced video poker to Las Vegas. The my story from that era, I'd actually come to Vegas just knowing basic strategy on one on a Vegas World trip. Vegas World advertised in whatever magazine, gambling something. Gambling, uh, gambling Times. Gambling Stanley Times. Ludicoff, so. That's it. Who's also gone? Did you know him too? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know what? I knew the editor, Len Miller, but I didn't know Stanley. So uh, at Vegas World, if you – this particular promotion is you bring, I don't know, post $3,500 at the cage and bet four hours a day at $35 a hand or something, and there's a package of benefits. Uh so that sounded pretty good to me. So I came and I signed up for it and showed up. And it happened the first night I was there. I got pretty lucky. I uh, The first thing I did when I sat down was ask for a $500 marker, which they happily brought me. But I never touched it. It just kept growing and growing, just using basic strategy just getting lucky uh, which didn't know what was happening didn't know what was lucky as far as I was concerned this was because I was good the the dealer for some reason kept telling me about what a nice gourmet room they had there and that I should go and uh, enjoy it and I, he was sure he could get me a comp and I was just going the dealer was going to get you a comp yeah he said I'm pretty sure I can talk the pit boss into giving you a comp. So I go, well, I already have RFB here because I'm on a, a program and, and I'm really enjoying myself, so I'm going to continue playing. So we continued playing, continued winning, and in another half hour, he would tell me again about the uh, gourmet room. And so I wasn't really figuring this out. Eventually, I decided to go. So I paid off my marker at the table, and they strangely gave me back my paid marker and pushed the $500 of chips back at me. So I both, so it was like a $500 bonus that I... Is this a great country or what? Exactly. I, I, had, I had won, and they had pushed me an extra $500 because they were flustered about something. Couldn't figure it out. So I went to the uh, gourmet room, enjoyed my dinner. And the next day, the dealer said, did you read the RJ? You're mentioned in the paper. The RJ is the review journal. And so I was on the front page of the review journal. And this, apparently what had happened was a group of players had approached a dealer and said they wanted him to do some false shuffles and insert a shoe in and they were going to clean up at Vegas World and then they were going to split the profits. So he said, yeah, I'll do this. And so then afterwards, uh, he went and he went up to Bob Stupak, who owned it, and he said, this is what's going to go down. What should I do? And so Stupak said, well, I'll let it go down, and we'll have Metro there, and we'll just arrest their asses. And uh, in addition, we'll put it 
uh, Stupak had a suite on the second floor with cameras on this one table that just happened to be the table that I sat down on. So apparently it was supposed to go off. at They were supposed to show up at 6 o'clock. And I showed up at a quarter to 6 and took my $500 marker and kept playing and playing and playing and and winning. And so the, the next day, Stupak, who kind of held office in the coffee shop there, he said, uh, I was hoping you'd win some more so I could kick your ass out of there and we could just get all this. But I didn't really want to bar you because they would think that was suspicious. And uh, But I just really wanted to get you out of there because uh, there's this Metro hanging around, playing slot machines, waiting for things to happen. There were guns involved. And uh, I didn't... It was had a date there to watch this go down and you were in the way so wow i i mean i i i obviously i don't condone cheating but i certainly feel for those guys who were there uh you know i mean how many times i've been in that situation where we're trying to get on a particular game and there's some guy on there that that we we want off but i we would have been much more proactive about trying to get you off the table both as players, and I'm surprised the casino didn't do something about it uh, to get you off. Well, they started offering comps to the uh, gourmet room. and Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Seems and to me they could have been more... It turned out they ended up giving me an extra 500 I think that was an accident, and I think it was because uh, they, were, they were nervous about this going down, too. But why were you on the cover of the paper? What did... All, all it mentioned was a. Uh, they took a while because this high roller took this five hundred dollar marker. That was who I was. I was a high roller because I had posted thirty five hundred dollars, and so that was my only mention. But I was the high roller who had posted. So they did uh, bust the guys after you left. Oh yeah! Apparently, it went down within five minutes. Huh. Of uh, they got there, uh, delivered the shoe. Uh, the dealer did a false cut, and I mean, all six positions at the table were taken by the team members, and uh, they uh, let them play two hands and making some, um, and of course they won all those. And uh, then all of a sudden there was plenty of Metro around. Wow. So um, that could have ended badly. I, uh, I'm surprised the players didn't try to get you off. Um I mean, certainly everyone I know has stories about the things they've done to try to get players off of tables. Um, you know, sort of the most creative, I think, was Tommy Hyland's team. Uh, had, had something called, uh, I think it was actually called a shit bag. <laughs> but it was a bag that had, uh, you know... We can so- guess. Soiled diapers, uh just anything foul and disgusting smelling that you could possibly imagine and they would go somebody that whoever was uh you know drew the short straw would be in charge of the bag and would have to carry this bag down (laughs) to the casino and sit next to the person that they were trying to get rid of and and open up the bag and under the table open the bag (laughs) yeah and um that would be more effective than just mere cigar smoke, and uh, yeah, certainly many people tried cigar smoke. They tried the uh, you know sort of gay uh, cruising of the person, uh, spilling drinks on people. I mean, lots and lots of things to get people off off of games, but none of those things happened to me. So, yeah. well, you were lucky. <laughs> so, in uh, eventually, got. And I specialized when I was playing blackjack in comp hustling or promotion hustling. Oh, wait, I wanted to ask you about Yeah. Um, you gave up backgammon, and, and you mentioned that was traumatic for you? Um, I don't know if it was traumatic, uh, a little bit. I came to the conclusion that I wasn't smart enough. And that, oh, well, that can be traumatic. And that I wasn't good enough. I was used to being the A student, the smartest kid in the room. And at the Cavendish, I wasn't. I was 
there was I was on a second tier. Um, I suppose you would, could say low level genius when everybody else was high level genius or something. I'm not sure it takes genius to play backgammon well, but it took more than I had. Mm. And realizing that if it, if the directions weren't written down that I could follow them, I just was out of my league. And the same with blackjack. Had I, I was probably got good enough that had I met someone like Richard on a team, I could have convinced them that I was good enough to keep on the team. But I would have not been the leader on the team at that point. No, but one of the things that I learned there uh, is that effective teams, whether it's blackjack or some other form of gambling, whether you, you have a sports betting outfit or whatever, um, there are different people that fill different roles. Yes. And, you know, if you're a guy who obviously you can learn the strategy and, and, and execute it well, which I'm, I have no doubt you can because it's really kind of the same thing in video poker, well, those people on a team are really important, you know? Yeah, we we call in the big players or or, or whatever whatever, have. whatever you have to do. Yep. And yeah. so you're betting table minimum and just doing it accurately and doing whatever else is required. And that I that I could have done perfectly. Right, right. And and there's some other guy who's going to write the code to analyze the new game and and there's the creative guy who is going to come up with innovative ways to beat games. And you need all those components for a really effective organization, I think. So, so yeah, you're right. It would have been different, I think, if you had met. Um, and, you know, when people ask me about advice, I tell them one of the first things they need to do is start meeting other players. You, you know, because you're, you're, you, it's really, really difficult to just do it on your own. Um, not not just for the moral support, but also if you have a, you know this in video poker, if you have a network of people that you know, you share information, and it's really valuable to have, you can't scout the whole world by yourself. So if you have friends that say, hey, there's a promotion in, you know, Kansas City, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't have found that by yourself. Yeah, and another thing I didn't realize in blackjack is eventually I got barred at a number of casinos and I thought what that meant is I can't go back in those casinos and play anymore <laughs> and now I um, you know some of the players who've been on this show they go oh yeah I, I've been barred from the same casino 18 times oh yeah, oh yeah and when we first started playing one of the good things about playing back then was they didn't have cameras or, or if they had them, they didn't have pictures. They couldn't, you know, print out a photo of, of who the guy was that they barred. So if we got barred on day shift, we went right back in on swing shift. I mean, they might have had a description, guy in a blue shirt with a mustache or something. But so, yeah, that was one of the good things about back then. Yeah, and that was, that's a little tip that you know a mentor would have shared and i just didn't have any mentors at the time we're going to stop today's show we're going to pick this up in the near future and at that time we're going to shift on to a little bit of video poker as to how that happened in the learning curve there and how richard got into teaching a little bit to his son today all right richard how can people get copies of our show well, first of all, we encourage you to send us your questions, engage with us at gamblingwithanedge.com, uh, or you can send us questions at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com or uh, our Facebook page, or you can tweet them at me at rwm21. You can sign up to get the show delivered to you automatically every week at gamblingwithanedge.com or iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you normally get your podcasts. And to see an archive of all of the old episodes, you can find that at bobdancer.com. Very good. Richard, today's been fun. We'll do it again for next week's show. And uh, in the meantime, everybody, go out and hit lots of royal flushes. Good day. <laughs>